Hi, I'm Amy Elizabeth, and I'm going to be telling you about our second president, John Adams, who was president from 1797 to 1801. We'll be doing this in preparation for you guys to do your first document-based question, or DBQ, in about a week. Now, taking a look at the screen, you'll notice that John Adams' 1796 presidential victory was a bit of a squeaker. Um, John Adams, a former friend of Thomas Jefferson, um, is a Federalist, and he took 51% of the vote, and 17 uh, and 71 electoral votes. Now, if you take a look at his former friend Thomas Jefferson, he took 49% of the vote and 68 electoral votes. Now, this is important because before um, the ratification of the 12th Amendment in 1804, people voted for two candidates. The person that won the most votes overall would become president. The person that took the most votes um, and came in second, um, yeah, came in second, sorry I phrased that strangely, um, would become vice president. So unfortunately, John Adams is stuck with his rival and political opposite, Thomas Jefferson, as his vice president. And this is going to make for a really interesting presidency. Um, let's go ahead and jump into it by talking about George Washington. Now, George Washington, first president. While he was president, um, France had a revolution, and as a result of France's revolution in 1789, they ended up kind of at war with literally everyone in Europe. And in this process of trying to find allies to back them in their war, um, France tried to pull the United States in. Why? Because um, France was an ally of the United States when we were seeking independence from Britain. So what are we going to do? Is the United States going to side with France, our longtime ally, or side with our former mother country? Um, Thomas Jefferson, Secretary of State and known Francophile, wants the United States to support France and fight for their liberty. Alexander Hamilton and um, pragmatist, he wants to support Great Britain because Great Britain is our greatest customer for American manufacturers, uh, manufacturers and raw materials. They are our largest trading partner. And Hamilton was worried about the economy if we were to support France. Now, George Washington in 1796 decided that he wasn't going to run for a third term as president. This is before that great amendment um, that was put into place um, ensuring that presidents could only serve two consecutive terms. Um, Washington set the precedent that people would only serve two. So that's not actually going to be in law until, um, until FDR in the 1930s. So Washington in 1796 announces that he is not going to run for president and actually gives a farewell address. And his farewell address includes three key points that are really important. The first is for Americans to put nation over faction and to not join political parties and that these kinds of divisions would actually weaken the nation. If you guys watch the news or know anything about American history, you know that we kind of didn't listen to Washington at all about the growth of political parties, which is unfortunate. Washington also warned about growing rivalries between regions, um, particularly the North and the South. And in US history, we refer to this as sectionalism. And sectionalism is actually going to continue to haunt our young country all the way through the Civil War. And it's going to be really tough. Um, and he wanted people to be thinking about the United States as a whole rather than worrying about the South or your individual state. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't come to pass either. And finally, um, Washington reinstated that he wanted the United States to remain neutral in foreign affairs because we are still a young country and we don't even have a Navy yet, y'all, in 1796, and that it would be very difficult for the U.S. to keep up with a fight between Britain and France. Unfortunately, um, we did not listen on this point either. Um, I also think that George Washington's farewell address is one of those documents that contains truly timeless advice for Americans. And I think that if you didn't read it in your class, or if you perhaps don't remember the document, that you should take a look at it. it it's a lot, and I think that 
you'll find it very instructive no matter what time period you are studying in U.S. history. Now, as we said at the start of this presentation, John Adams is a Federalist and he wins um, the election of 1796. His rival, Thomas Jefferson, who is a Democratic Republican, becomes his vice president. So, with John Adams' presidency, we're going to talk about four main things. In terms of domestic policy, we're going to talk about the Alien and Sedition Acts, the um, publication of the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions in 1798, the XYZ Affair in 1797 in terms of foreign policy, and the results of the election of 1800. As you guys can tell by um, John Adams' dates as president, he does not win the election of 1800 for some very important reasons. So let's jump into it. Now, the war between England and France is causing all kinds of problems for Adams early on in his administration, primarily because um, France is frustrated with American neutrality and they begin to take American merchant ships and cargo at sea. Now, when you're neutral, no one's supposed to bother you. They're supposed to leave you alone. And um, upon hearing that this is continuing to be a problem for people working at sea, Adams sent a team of diplomats to France to negotiate um, some sort of trade rights or agreement to respect American neutrality. Unfortunately, things don't go as planned. Um, and in fact, three French officials who are nicknamed X, Y, and Z in um, in American history actually demanded a bribe of um, Adams's diplomatic team, saying that the only way that France would meet with and listen to the grievances of the United States um, would actually be if they paid. Now this is not something that happens. If you send diplomats to negotiate or to have talks, typically speaking you're not supposed to charge money. Pay for play in politics is something that is not okay, no matter what country you're from. Um, and the United States, um, and in particular Federalists, were incredibly offended um, once the news of the XYZ affair, as it will later be called, leaked. And they actually called for President Adams to go to war with France. But Adams is going to keep his cool for a little bit. So what are the results of the XYZ affair? Um, the biggest result of the XYZ affair is going to be um, the creation of the American Navy, um, which is going to be a major point of the Federalists to continue to protect our merchant vessels at sea, and um, the beginning of an undeclared naval war that historians refer to as the Quasi War, which lasts from 1798 to 1800. Um, and the Federalists take this advantage um, of everyone being so outraged at France, and they're able to not only build up the Navy, but also do some other things to silence their um, their rivals, the Democratic Republicans. I'm, I'm already squirming in my seat because it's just, ugh, all of this is just, ugh. I, I can't, you guys. It's it's a lot. Um, and at the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, the diplomats, um, Charles Pinckney, um, Elbridge Gerry, and John Marshall, and a picture of Foreign Minister Talleyrand, um, who represents France. Now, if you guys don't know anything about the French Revolution, please let me know. I would be delighted to make you a presentation about the French Revolution. It's wild. So um, this is the political cartoon that I showed you with the XYZ affair. Um, America is depicted as the woman wearing the headdress. The reason why she is having all of her stuff stolen by the French is meant to represent how the United States is so weak that it's just getting robbed. Um, I'm sure there's some kind of gender commentary here in depicting America as a woman being robbed by men. I, yeah. But I really recommend that in your readings, if you see political cartoons like this one, that you go ahead and pay attention to them. Um, the College Board and your teachers, no matter where you go to school, love using visual documents, um, using visuals as primary source documents. Now, 
after the XYZ affair and the buildup of the American Navy, um, there is going to be a lot of criticisms led by the Democratic Republicans, the party of Thomas Jefferson. And in fact, um, the Federalists in Congress, they passed the Alien and Sedition Acts. And the most important part about the Alien and Sedition Acts is that they make it a crime to criticize government leaders. Um, and if you read it, um, it's this long, sentence where it says, if any person shall write, uh, utter, or publish, or shall cause or procure to be written, printed, uttered, or published, or shall knowingly or willingly assist in the aid of writing, printing, or uttering, or publishing, you, like you can't criticize the government, which is obviously going to be in conflict with what right? Our First Amendment rights of free speech. Um, and it's really problematic. Uh. The other part um, is that it is going to be easier to deport immigrants. And the immigrants that are targeted by the Alien and Sedition Acts are immigrants that are a part of hostile uh, or a part of groups that are hostile to the United States and that could perhaps um, create problems for the United States. So this would include um, French nationals that are advocating for the United States to support France, perhaps radical um, people from Britain, whatever. But the Sedition Acts do make it legal to deport any man 14 years of age or older or arrest them um, for being in the United States and not being a citizen. Um, it also makes citizenship more difficult because once you become a citizen you and you own land, you have the right to vote. And this is going to backfire on President Adams and the Federalist Party. And in fact, if any of you guys grow up um, and go into politics, please don't take away people's rights as, as human beings for free speech and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not going to work out well for you. Um, if you want to fight your enemies, there are better ways to do it, I promise. Um, and this is going to backfire on President Adams and the Federalist Party. And it's also going to backfire on the United States. So, again, um, the Alien and Sedition Acts were caused by the quasi-war and the criticism of President Adams and Congress. And the effect of the Alien and Sedition Acts is going to be the publication and circulation of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, which is, oh, y'all, I can't. So let's get into the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Now, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions were written by Democratic Republicans Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Remember that Madison might have helped uh, write the um, Constitution and advocated for a federal government, but he was by no stretch of the imagination um, a Federalist. And the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions are actually a series of essays that attack the Federalist Party. And they are the first document to argue that states could actually ignore um, federal laws that um, they find unfair or that they believe overstretch um, the boundaries of what the federal government is supposed to be able to do. And this is called nullification. And these arguments for states' rights and nullification are going to continue to haunt the United States all the way up until the Civil War and were cited by people who supported the, um, the secession of the American South in 1861. So good job, Jefferson. Um, good job, Madison. I know they didn't intend this, um, but it is deeply upsetting. And this is one of the documents that is in your DBQ that you guys will use to assess. Now, um, again, what this is going to do is encourage states to challenge the constitutional premise that the federal government has supreme authority over the states in certain arenas. Um, and that's really difficult. And what this is going to show in very specific ways is that the balance of power between the federal government and the state government is still up for grabs.
Now, Adams and the Federalist Party are going to remain extremely unpopular um, throughout the rest of Adams's presidency, and they and Adams is going to lose the election of 1800. And um, Thomas Jefferson is going to again defeat Adams, and we're going to see a peaceful transfer of power from the Federalist Party to the Democratic Republican Party in the election of 1800 which is what we're going to start with next week, talking about um, what historians often refer to as the Revolution of 1800. And the important part about all of this is that Jefferson's victory is going to mark um, a period of dominance of the Democratic Republican Party for the next 30 years. So I hope, thank you so much for watching and don't forget, make good choices.